this is Stan, and uh, it's Christmas Eve, and so I want to take this time to uh, wish you a blessed Christmas and a much better 2021. Yeah, that's a great question. Do you remember Christmas Eve 1968? Well, of course, many of you can't, but uh, many of you don't, but I really do, and there's a good reason for that. You know, I was thinking about that because 1968, if you remember the year, it was a bad year. It was not a good year at all, but it ended on a very powerful and encouraging and a wonderful note. It was kind of a gift from heaven, so to speak. And I, I was thinking about that, and I went back into the uh, files of stuff and found a nice little eight-minute video presentation that was actually done uh, a couple years ago because it was a celebration of, yeah, celebration of that event of 50 years ago at that time, and now, of course, 52. So what I would like to do is just right now share that little video with you because I think it'll bring back some memories of difficult times, but also just a glimpse of heaven, a glimpse of what God might be about as we hear his words said, repeated, and uh, engaged in fully right now. So uh, without any more of me, Let's uh, give this. This is for you on this Christmas Eve. It's a Saturn V rocket, a model of the rocket that gave us the last big headline of that troubled year, 1968. Just in time for Christmas, the rocket took three Americans to the moon. Half century later, as we conclude our series on the year 1968, Lee Cowan takes us back. Although the moon seems ever so familiar, we're really barely acquainted. Only a few souls have ever ventured there and back, and of those who have, few are left. Bill Anders, though, is one of them. I'm Bill. I'm Lee. Hey, Lee. It's so nice to meet you. Still flying high at age 85. Well, I figure I'd keep flying as long as I can crawl in them. <laughs> to look an Apollo astronaut in the eye, it's hard not to imagine what those eyes have seen. Right. Well, Anders especially. Doing this with us. 50 years ago this week, on Christmas Eve, no less, he and the crew of Apollo 8 saw our home as no human ever had. Like a holiday ornament hanging over the moon. It was ironic that we'd done all this work to come and explore the moon, and what we really discovered was the Earth. The year was 1968. Little seemed right with the world that Christmas. War, riots, assassinations. The mood was hardly festive, says the author of a recent book on Apollo 8, Jeffrey Kluger. This was a year of sorrow, of suffering, and of massive bloodshed. And then at the end of the year, we had this moment to do this magnificent thing. It was serendipity saying, humanity, you guys deserve a break. Make the most of it. The launch was set for just four days before Christmas. The command module that sat high atop the most powerful machine man had ever built looked tiny then and still does, where it sits at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Jim Lovell sat in the middle seat. I suddenly found myself 360 feet high, and I looked down below, and there was the news media people coming in to park their cars. It was still dark. And I thought to myself, they're sending me to the moon. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. My biggest remembrance about Saturn V was the noise. Oh, and there's the rumble in our building. There's no way that you could simulate or train for the noise that that beast put out. This building is shaking under us. Apollo 8's commander, Frank Borman, knew this would be a mission full of firsts. Man is farther away from home than he's ever been before, a hundred times farther away. If everything went right, mankind would never be the same. But to Borman, only one first really mattered. What I wanted to do was go to the moon and come back alive because I knew that would beat the Russians. We're looking forward now, of course, to the day after tomorrow when we'll be uh, just 60 miles away from the moon. Happy birthday, mother. 
So everyone, the Russians included, was glued to their black and white TV. What do you have today, Bill, for uh, dinner? Although it seemed like we were right there with them. Chicken and gravy? Apollo 8 was really very much alone. I could put my thumb up to the window and completely hide the earth. Now you have to think about that. Over five billion people, everything I ever knew was behind my thumb. Did you guys say anything to each other? I mean, this was the first time mankind had ever left the earth's pole. I think that was the least of our worries. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's true. <laughs> After all, they weren't just going to the moon, they were going to orbit it 10 times. But then it actually happened. On Christmas Eve, that lonely, barren place got some human tidings of great joy. We're like three school kids looking into a candy store window, watching those ancient old craters on the far side slowly slip underneath us. But describing what they saw proved almost as hard as getting there. Do you remember what you said? Well, I said that it, uh, it looked like dirty beach sand. A very whitish gray like uh, dirty beach sand. That's how I described it, thus gaining the wrath of uh, poets worldwide. You know, <laughs> could he have done better? <laughs> Probably. It really didn't need words in the end. As it turned out, a single photo would do most of the talking. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. Wow, is that pretty? Problem was, they had precious little film on board. And what they had was supposed to be used to take pictures of the moon, not the Earth. Hey, don't take that from schedule. But Anders did it anyway. That wasn't in the flight plan. He was right. The hell with that, you know. Uh, and here was a beautiful shot. Hand me a roll of color quick. Oh, man, that's great. Known as Earth Rise, it became one of the most reproduced images ever. In part, because no other photograph summed up our place in the universe, our small place at that, quite like this. This was just a beacon of hope as well as awe. It pointed the way toward a new understanding of who we are as human beings. Even for a brief moment. Even for a brief moment. For environmental crusader Al Gore, that image was proof of just how fragile our world is. It's the spirit behind the climate change exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And it's the centerpiece to almost every climate presentation the former vice president has ever given. Is it fair to say that that one image was one of the biggest catalysts for the environmental movement? Oh, no question about it. Within a year and a half, the first Earth Day was organized. The momentum emerged in the Congress for the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. It transformed the environmental movement into what it became in the immediate aftermath of that image. It alone may have been enough to secure Apollo 8's place in the conscience of humanity. But it wasn't the final word on that Christmas Eve night. The crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. Do you have any idea, though, how many people would be listening in and watching? Well, we were told that we would have the largest audience that ever listened to a human voice before. But what to say? What words would resonate through the heavens on one of the holiest nights of the year? They settled on ones that already had, from the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It was pitch perfect. They were the words of three, in some ways, very ordinary humans. I always say they had very lunch bucket names, Frank and Bill and Jim. What could be more human than that? And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Did you know at the time what kind of impact that would have? No, but, but as, we, uh, as we flew and as we, as we contemplated it afterwards, we all agreed that, that we couldn't have done anything more appropriate. So there. On the way home, three explorers named Borman, Lovell, and Anders, whose names are going down in the history books as surely as did Magellan, Vasco da Gama, and Columbus. They were indeed sailors on a new ocean, returning from a successful voyage at the end of one of our most turbulent years during a season 
all about peace. We got thousands of telegrams after the flight, but the one that struck me the most, thank you, Apollo 8, you saved 1968. And I think in the way we helped to help to heal it. Good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Thank you for your time, and uh, I hope you uh, found that encouraging, as I did. Also, it's uh, neat to know that uh, those uh, three young men at that time are, of course, no longer young. Uh, they went on to live successful lives after that adventure, uh, some difficult lives, some very difficult times, but uh, all three of them are now in their 90s. <laughs> and uh, still pressing and carrying on. And Christmas is a time in where, no matter what the darkness is, we do look for the light. I uh, now will spend a little time getting ready for Christmas Eve service. Uh, they asked me to prepare the prayers for the Christmas Eve service, and boy, have I been thinking about that. How do we pray? Both in praise and in petition at this uh, time where the Christmas season comes right up against the crisis of the COVID session upon us. And most of us don't really have any clue of what 2021 will bring. Our strategic plans, our goals, the things that we were thinking would happen. Uh, I know that my wife and I were hoping that uh, we would start 2021 on a visit to the Holy Land. It's not going to happen. But God is still in charge. Uh, heaven is still full of goodness and grace. The angels are still around. And we know, even though the future is uh, somewhat dark and dreary in many ways and unpredictable in all kinds of ways, we do know that there is deep light and deep grace and deep love. And so uh, do what those guys did. Why don't you go back and read Genesis 1 once again and think about it and then find that piece of Christmas scripture and particularly maybe a piece of just the promise of the word of God and read it again. Light a candle. Uh, listen to a song and say a prayer. I wish you all the best and blessings in 2021. And if I can help you, and I think I can, please reach out to me at stanhouston at gmail.com, stanhouston at gmail.com. I hope we connect. I would look forward to that. Best and blessings. Yes, indeed. Best and blessings. Best and blessings. Best and blessings. God is real. God is here. He is among us. He came to be one of us, and he assures us that all will be well.